Well, welcome everyone. We are so glad that uh, Nicole uh, Atwell from class of 2000 is, uh, you know, sharing her expertise and her love of her, her dogs with us today. My name is Thomas MacArthur and I serve as the Assistant Vice President for Alumni and Family Engagement here at Worcester. And um, I'm also joined by Sonia, um, who, are, who is our, another staff member who is helping us today. So if you have any questions, it's a smaller group, but if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, or at one point we will unmute everyone so there can be some discussion, but Nicole has some slides that she's gonna go through um, and then we'll kind of turn it over to more discussion based. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, which is right below down at the bottom of your screen. Um, we are recording today. So if you know it, we take that you having your video on and being here as a consent to record, um, but otherwise you can turn your stuff off if you'd prefer not to be seen. Um, and we will get started. So Nicole, thank you so much for doing this. We are so thrilled to have this as part of the Alumni Winter College here at Worcester and we'll turn it over to you. All right, so hi everybody. As Thomas mentioned, I'm Nicole Atwell, class of 2000. Um, it's funny that we're doing this on Valentine's Day downstairs with my dogs uh, is my Valentine, Chad Atwell, class of 97. <laughs> there are, they are our, our kids. Um, so he's trying to keep them quiet while I profess to know everything to know there is about dogs. Um, so, uh, these are the, this is a photo of me with two of my dogs, two of my three. Um, we have, we have Dobermans. Um, the, the black one in the picture is Tess. She's still with us. She is, um, over 13 years old now. I think this picture was taken. Well, she was maybe eight. Um, and the red is, her name was Gilly. And she is the reason for all of these ribbons back here. Um, she was an incredible agility athlete and we sadly lost her to cancer in June. Um, but we now have a puppy who is 10 months old. So we're going through the whole process all over again. And I'm reminded just how difficult puppies can be. Um, but so that's us and quick, uh, quick photo credit. Tipping point photography is Liz Farina Markles, uh, class of 2002. Um, she made a swing through Pittsburgh one year. Um, we got together, we took some pictures. She takes wonderful photos of humans and dogs. <laughs> um, I'm having a little difficulty switching my slides. There we go. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I've been a dog owner and basically a dog nerd then since 2007. Um, I'm active in confirmation dog shows. So that's like, you know, Westminster, you see that on TV. Um, there's a lot more that happens before you get to the, what you see on Westminster. Um, uh, but it's been, that's been a lot of fun. That takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of time to just stand there and look pretty. Um, I also do companion sports, performance events, therapy dog work. I love to work with my dogs. Um, being, being Dobermans are a working breed. They love to have a job. They love to do things. Um, and so, you know, I've just kind of thrown myself into it with them and it's been super rewarding. Um, it's a, I'm a member of the Doberman Pinscher Club of America. Um, you know, with that, you know, if you, the picture with uh, with Gilly down there, agility. Um, she was high in trial in many trials. She was uh, she qualified for the National Agility Championships for three years. She was uh, in the top twenty of her breed for a couple of years straight. I mean, she was she was an impressive, impressive girl, and she was the first dog I did agility with. Um, and so she really, you know. Now we're working on the puppy. We're getting her, you know, getting her started with it, which is super fun. Um, but, you know, but the most important thing, even though I pretend to know a lot of things about it is that I'm always learning. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, it, there's so much of a rabbit hole that you can go down when it comes to dogs. Um, so if we can unmute folks for a little bit, if you wanna tell me about your dogs, tell me about yourselves, um, share any challenges that you're having, because I think, you know, as I go through the slides and as I go through the presentation, if we, if there are specific things we can address, are there things that you need? And then, you know, of course, feel free to, um, to ask questions throughout, we'll raise your hand in the chat box and we'll, we'll take care of you. So Nicole, I've asked everyone to unmute. So you should be able to unmute yourselves. <laughs> like everyone has. Yay. Um, <laughs> I can, I can start. We just um, rehomed a standard poodle. I don't know if you guys can see him. This I is can. Marilyn. We love standard poodles. <laughs> and he, <laughs> um, he came to us in September. And so what we've been doing is he didn't have very much confidence. Yeah. Um, the woman who had him worked a whole lot and she realized after a while it was unfair to keep him because she had him in a crate 10 to 12 hours a day. 
And so um, we're working on getting him exposed to life, basically. And so, um, but it, he's, he's a lot of fun. He's doing really well. He's gotten a lot more confident. But I'm, when, he, when I get home from work, he goes bananas. And <laughs> um, he doesn't jump on me, but he jumps straight in the air and he crashes into my, I have another dog who's older and he crashes into him. And that's my only challenge is like, well, I mean, I need to keep getting him less scared of life, but um, <laughs> how do I get him to not crash into the 14 year old standard poodle that <laughs> we have? Good question. We'll, I will address that a little bit because I have, I have a crate training segment a little bit later. Um, so we can talk about that. Who's next? <laughs> Back up, goofball. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, would you like to go next? Sure. I lost my view of everybody. Oh, no. I have a little video thing in the lower corner. Is that what I hit? Yeah, there's Nicole. Okay. <laughs> Just a sec. <laughs> Are we in? Yep. Yes. So this good. is Fonzie. He is um, um, Havanese, mm -hmm. so he's a little Cuban dog, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, he's very smart and very fun. Um, you know, he sits and stands and comes and does all that stuff, but um, we need to work on same thing, not jumping up okay. and um, staying. He's not real good with that um and more tricks and stuff so okay. he's just he's ready to go <laughs> all right i'll, I'll ha i have some things for you <laughs> okay <laughs> you want to go back to sleep <laughs> elizabeth would you like to go next sure um so i have i don't know if she'll come on the screen right now i have a 10 month old almost 11 month old bernadoodle named fern oh my goodness <laughs> um I just, I didn't, I did research before getting a mixed breed. I like the non-shedding and I live in an apartment. I really love the Bernese, but 110, 120 pound dog just wasn't exactly going to work <laughs> yet. I'm like, yet, yeah, hopefully someday. Um, but I'm finding she's got all of the great traits of both breeds, the intelligence yeah. of the poodle, definitely. Uh -huh. She's so smart, but then the stubbornness of the Bernese too. So the smart plus the stubborn makes her really kind of fun to train. Uh -huh. <laughs> She knows exactly what she should be doing, but you know, it's gotta like make her work to do it. Um, we've gone to a couple puppy classes, two levels of puppy classes. Good. And I was reading about like the AKC canine good citizen, yeah. and maybe the agility stuff. And I'm thinking those would be really nice to keep doing. I wanna keep doing training, but um, same, I think um, as Kathy, she's, so because of quarantine, she hasn't met a ton of people. We see dogs yeah. on our walks and people, but jumping when greeting is definitely something I try to work on all the time and it's ongoing. So I echo that one. Okay. Um, and then I think she's, I think it's again, like the, the stubbornness, she's good. She knows, you know, recall, but she doesn't really do it unless she really wants to do it. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what, like, do I have a cheese stick? Do I have a piece of chicken? Like she'll see that. <laughs> she'll look at it. But then she'll, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So mm -hmm. here, Fernie, come on. Yeah. Please. We're working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. All right, Casey Henderson. Casey, I'll ask you to unmute. Hi. So I just I'm backlit now because I'm moving to the dogs because the dogs are not moving to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I'm Casey Henderson, class of O2. Good to see you, Elizabeth, and glad to meet you in person, Nicole, in mm -hmm. person as we get right now. Right. Um, uh, so uh, I have been an animal rescue volunteer for the past uh, oh 15 years or so. So I've done a lot of dog rescue work and uh, fostered lots of dogs. And uh, I have two senior dogs at this point, um, having been through what all of you have already been through with insane dogs. So my insane dog made it to 14 <laughs> and he passed away from cancer a few years ago. So um, I have my, his little sister who's now 14 and I recently adopted um, a 10 year old dog um, who's a, a big girl, she's a lab mix. And so here, let's see, this is, let's see if I can get down to her level. Oh, there. Uh, this is uh, RBG. I call her Ruthie most of the time. I'm going to 
perk up at all. I know these are these are old dogs. Uh -huh. They're like, N this is such nap time. Come on, come say hi. <laughs> and then her sister is Violet, who is very much asleep right now. <laughs> there we go. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So these are not agile dogs. Um, <laughs> um, Ruthie has severe arthritis and can go on um, like a 30 minute walk each day. That's about it. So um, I'm here because I, I want to support other dog owners and I've been very experienced with uh, dog challenges. So anything I can do to help additionally. And I just I love hearing dog stories and talking to other dog people. Great. All right. Yeah. And Ron, I've just asked you to unmute, so you should be able to unmute yourself. Is the voice, does the voice work here? It does. Yep, we can hear well, you. My lovely wife. Oh, first of all, um, Centennial class, and if you don't know what that is, look it up. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I can't count that, that far. Uh, this is, we have sort of a COVID designer dog. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> designer dog because we wanted something with a lot of poodle in it uh, because oh. it has hair and my wife tends to be a little allergic and she's in love right now can you see this <laughs> uh, Ann Harlan did not go to Worcester but she's a big, guys. <laughs> big, big fan of the college um, and in any event uh, this little lad was born what May 15th or 16th wow. is that right yeah and um, we had been able to go see uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. We love the book and we love the play even more. So this little dog has a big name, Atticus Finch <laughs> Neal. Nice. Better known around here is Addie. Awesome. And um, his breeder described him as chill when we got him. And, and she was right. He's, he's, he gets along with everything and everyone. I think if we had a... a a complaint or a problem it is he, he likes to eat cloth yeah and then he throws it up <laughs> so or, or can't process it through his small little mm -hmm. intestinal system and aside from the cost it makes him really sick but he's a chewer yeah. and he um he's a sniffer i mean he'll just outside he'll eat and chew everything mm -hmm. um plus we'd love him not to lick our face i mean oh. we love him but if you have any ideas on that without upsetting him, we would love to hear them. Well, then I'll comment. Others probably have been through this uh, learning curve. Um, we, we finally read something, an AKC piece, I think it was, that said, you know, you really shouldn't let the dog's tongue get in your nostrils and on your <laughs> lips and places like that. And, and yet it's so charming. <laughs> it's hard to resist. Only for us, not in front. Yeah, for, for us. So that's our story. All right, great. So yeah, I mean, my thanks for everybody for sharing. I love to see your dogs and hear all about them. Um, you know, so my goal with this presentation is to you know give you a high level view of ideas, a few tips and tricks, some additional resources to look into, um, resources that I myself use that I you know have have come to to really depend on in my journey. Um, I might go on a few tangents about my dogs because that's what I do. Um, but you know, I want to help you you know live a good life with your dogs. So. Um, Next slide. And I think you guys are a little bit beyond this, but we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll throw out here the basics, you know, what are you working with, right? You age, Casey, you can teach an old dog new tricks, right? Um, <laughs> that's not, you know, age is not a limiter. Um, and breed matters, as Elizabeth was saying, right? Like, you know, those breed traits, you know what you're working with. Um, I think for people who, um, there's some folks who, you know, and I'm not saying that anybody here is one of those, but I, you know, I run into a lot of people like, oh, I just love the look of this dog. Well, yeah, but you know, what else, what else is behind it? What are you, what do you, you know, what are genetics? I mean, genetics are a huge thing. Like, yes, it's in how they're raised, but it's also where they come from. It's also, you know, what's behind them. Um, and sometimes humans kind of have to get creative or maybe even just learn to accept some of those like ingrained inbred behaviors you know, that, that happen with dogs or, or figure out how to, you know, figure out how to live with it, figure out how to kind of work around it. Um, you know, terriers need to dig, herding breeds need to herd and sometimes nip at your kids because they're not doing what they need to do. Um, you know, guardian breeds like mine can be a little bit territorial. We're working on barking at the neighbors. <laughs> Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, sight hounds need to chase, scent hounds need to, to sniff on things. And so you just kind of have to, you know, accept 
accept some things that you may not be able to change. It's what is that the acceptance or what is that the, the prayer? Sometimes you just have to accept it. Um, but you know, I'm, I want to help you work as much as you can within. Um, also their background, right? So early neurological stimulation, early, early exposures to things with, you know, when they're at their breeders or if, if it's an unknown background, um, you know, what is, what are you working with there? Um, they're starting to actually find interesting research that epigenetics are a thing in dogs. So it's what the mother was exposed to or what the father was exposed to. I mean, it's, you know, they're starting to find that with humans and they're starting to find it with dogs. So it's, it's a really, it's a really interesting, um, um, it's really, you know, some interesting research on that. So for me, you know, in thinking about what your goals, I think a lot of you mentioned, you know, what your goals are, and that's great. Um, me, um, I also just wanted a canine good citizen on my older dog. And then it just kind of went from there. I remember I found the, the paperwork that we sent to her breeder um, initially. Um, what are your goals with this dog? I'd like to maybe put a canine good citizen on her. Mm -hmm, yes. And then, you know, it just, it kind of blew up from there because the, the, you know, the breed loves to work. The breed loves to, to have a job. Um, and, and it just sucked me in. Um, so speaking of work, dogs are a lot of work, but that's not a bad thing. I mean, they were bred to be part of our lives. I mean, when they, from the first wolves that were domesticated by the cavemen, right? I mean, they had a job to do. They were part of our lives. We made them that way. So, you know, we, we also have to be able and willing to, to put in that work to, you know, so, to sort of honor them. And that connection can be so rewarding. Um, my dogs, when it's time to work, you know, their eyes just get like, you know, they're bright and they're like, okay, we're going to do stuff. This is, you know, this is wonderful. So, um, Next slide, care and feeding, just have to put this in there, give a good quality food in a reasonable amount. Um, you know, you guys all seem to take really good care of your dogs, but I see a lot of dogs out there that are overloved, if you will, with <laughs> too much food. Um, you know, ideally you're supposed to look down and kind of see a waste. Um, a lot of people will be like, yeah, but you know, the, the bag says 10 pounds. Mm your dog is 10 pounds, but they should be eight, you know, so, you know, work on kind of scaling that back. If, if you're doing a lot of training, if you're doing a lot of treats, just kind of like keep an eye on, keep an eye on the dog. You should, you know, should be able to see some shape um, and, uh, you know, and, and scale back accordingly. You're not going to make them mad. They're not going to be mad at you. <laughs> They'll still love their food. They'll still want to work. Um, there are some trainers um, who actually just use the dog's daily food allowance as, um, as treats and as working. I don't need to do that with my dogs because they have enough drive to do other things, um, and enough of a metabolism that it's fine. Um, but you know, that's something, you know, potentially to keep in mind. Um, so, you know, regular vet checks, exercise, physical and mental, and I'll get into that a little bit later. And, and, and an important thing too, I have a lot of friends who are groomers, um, the biggest thing that they say is to, you know, desensitize your dog to some things before they go to the groomers, get them used to having their feet handled, get them used to being brushed, get them used to, you know, having somebody look around in their mouth, like just get them used to that so that they're a little easier on my groomer friends. <laughs> um, and finally, we we know our dogs best and we are their advocates. So never feel ashamed, you know, if, if you have a question at your vet, um, to speak up and ask for it, ask for additional tests. If you think something's not right, ask for, you know, if, if they're, if they're, if you don't agree with a trainer, that's fine, right? Like you are, we, we are their voice. Um, so just, you know, some easy things to keep in mind. Um, socialization, <laughs> one of my favorite quotes ever, uh, from the princess bride. A lot of people, when they think of socialization, thinks that it means, literally socializing, but it doesn't actually. It's going out, it's learning about the world, it's feeling confident, right? And um, I think it was, Kathy, you mentioned confidence with your dog and it, it's so hard right now. And, and you know, my, my puppy, she came, you know, she came to us in June. Um, it's been a challenge to get out and go places and to do things with her. Um, luckily she came from a breeder who did a lot of, you know, background socialization and, and, and acclimating to sounds and, and things like that. But, um, you know, you really, you want to be able to teach them about the world and it's really hard to do that right now. So one of the, my favorite places to take a dog, 
Um, besides, you know, yes, you have a neighborhood walk, but if, you're, if your local Lowe's or Home Depot is dog friendly, that's a great place to go because a lot of people there are surprised to see a dog. And so they will kind of leave them alone. And that's the thing about visiting. <laughs> If you visit too much as a puppy, you may be ingraining things that are going to be problem behaviors later. So every single person that that puppy meets, here, give them a treat. Um, do you want to pet my dog? This is wonderful. They don't have to do that with everybody because you're setting up an expectation, basically, that every single person as they're an adult dog is going to want to do that. And that's not true. So you are their, you are their guide. You are their world. You want to, you know, you want to let them go places and let them see, pe see people from a distance, but they don't always have to meet and greet everybody. Um, it literally took here, go, here, go off on a tangent. So my puppy it took her yesterday for the very first time, um, up to an agility trial environment. She had been in a similar space, maybe about two or three weeks ago, and it just blew her mind. It was, you know, an, another agility um, area, but, you know, the equipment and the, oh my God, there's other dogs here. Oh my God, there's, and she, she just, she lost it. So, you know, I worked on a little attention. I worked on what I could get. And so I was actually really worried yesterday when I took her up to a new place. Um, I was so impressed with how well she did because when we had been in that place that wasn't it, you know, there were like four people in the building the time, the first time that I took her. And then yesterday it was a full agility trial, but she was like, oh, so this is similar to that. Okay. This is how I need to act. Was she a little crazy? Sure. She's a 10 month old puppy. <laughs> um, but she, but she was a lot more acclimated. So if you think about also to like building on things, you don't want to throw everything at them at once. You want to, you know, incrementally kind of move things and then keep interactions positive. Um, you are the one who delivers treats if they do something, you know, or if they, if they see a person and then look back at you. Um, so that kind of stuff. Um, so let's see, I have my notes on a different thing. So if I'm looking up and looking down, <laughs> um, you'll have to, you'll have to forgive me. Um, so we talked a little, so a little bit about training classes. Um, there are a lot of really great places, um, you know, I think the default that a lot of people go to are like Petco, Pet, PetSmart. If that's what you have, if that's what you, if that's what's available, that's great. But here's some other additional options of places to look. I will always look for an all breed kennel club or an actual like dog training club or facility. Um, mostly because I have dogs that don't think like other dogs, right? Like they are, they're, <laughs> That's not special needs, but I mean, they, they definitely have a different way of thinking and a different way of doing things. And I, they're not, they don't think like labs. They don't work like, you know, uh, like a, a, a mixed breed. They, they have a very different focus. And so me personally, I will always go to a place like that, or I will have one-on-one -on -one instruction. So my agility trainer is someone who literally has worked with Dobermans before. She has owned them. She has competed with them. She knows how they think. She knows what they're, you know, kind of what's going on back behind the brain. Um, so, but if you can't get to classes, there's also some really great online resources. Um, Fenzy Dog Sports Academy has a ton of resources. It says dog sports, yes, but they do have just general pet um, pet training. They have a, a pet training course. Um, there's different levels that you can that you can take. Um, you can just audit a course. You can you know pay all the way to a gold level and have like the best access to all of the trainers. That you know it's really up to you what you want to get out of it. Um, and then Absolute Dogs, they're out of Britain. They have a really unique kind of way of thinking about um, the way a dog orients to you and the way a dog, um, the kind of how you create the world around the dog. Um, they're, they're really interesting and they're really fun. Um, so then, you know, just some general, general training tips. Um, the best advice I ever got was don't just say no, you know, show them what you want them to do and, and reward that. Um, the, the, I, when we were still able to go to vets offices and sit in waiting rooms, I can't tell you how many times I saw people, you know, who had a dog who just wanted to go visit or just wanted to do something. And it was just, no, 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 no. But the dog didn't know what it should be doing. It just knew what it shouldn't be doing. And so, you know, if you're going out, 
always have trees with you if you, you know, and, and let them know. And that's the way we communicate with them. We, you know, we feed them, we give them praise, we play with them. So, you know, you want to, you want to reward what you see that's correct um, and not just always say no. So keeping it positive, marking the correct behavior. So an example with keeping it positive and marking the correct uh, puppy, puppy loves, my puppy Isa loves to um, harass the cat. So we're working on that um, because, you know, he's not just a little puppy that will play with you. Um, so, you know, what I've done is I've turned it into a game, right? If she's starting to approach the puppy or sorry, if she's starting to approach the cat, I will call her name. As soon as she reorients to me, I tell her good girl. And I've got a treat ready for her. So she has started because they are as smart as any human. Sometimes she started to be like, oh, okay. So if I just go over to the cat and then if I already turn around, I was like, yeah, no, that's fine. We'll continue to play this game. So you just have to kind of like think about what's causing it and see if you can kind of like, you know, intercept it basically um, to, to, you know, I mean, yes, you want to note mistakes. Like I say, you know, you don't, but you know, don't nag like the, the people that I see at the vet's office, don't nag your dog, tell them what you want, show them what you want. Um, and then, and then work on that and reinforce it. Um, so, and also know what your dog likes and work with it. So not every dog likes treats. Some dogs like toys. Some dogs will literally just work for a pat on the head and good girl. So knowing what they, what they like and knowing what really gets them amped up, especially if it's something that's, um, super distracting. So with the cat, I will have like the best stuff, you know, sitting next to me on the couch when I know he's around and, and you know, get that, get that puppy his attention. And, oh my God, this is so much better than, you know, pawing at the cat. <laughs> um, so also too, as I kind of mentioned, generalizing can be hard. Um, this is the old, but she's so good at home. <laughs> they don't necessarily, they context, context is, is, is something that, that dogs can tend to struggle with. So and, and distractions in the world. So yeah, you've got a great, you've got an automatic sit at home, right? But you're at the pet store and you are checking out and that puppy is not doing what you're saying. It's just, you know, that, that environment is a little bit different. They need to learn that, no, this still means this in this situation. They're not being obstinate. They're not being, um, they're not being difficult. They just, <laughs> they don't know yet. Right. And, and that is just another thing to work through. Um, know that sometimes the gains are painfully and incrementally hard and you may need to have some creative problem solving. Like I said, right, like try and get in and intercept and try and figure out what is the um, there's a trainer who who thinks she she talks a lot about antecedents. What is the thing that causes this to happen and how can we kind of get ahead of that um, so the dog doesn't make the mistake in the first place? Um, and then complex problems. Um, there's a, there's a um, philosophy, uh, training philosophy of shaping, right? It's just, you break it down into these, like, a, it's like a math problem. You break a big problem down into little component parts. And, and so I have a link here that when we send it out, you guys can, can check that out yourself, but, um, I'm not the best at that <laughs> personally. Um, but it, it is super effective when it works. Um, you know, it's, it's, I want my dog to be able to put her feet up on, you know, on a balance ball when I'm working on, you know, so, you know, they just, they look at the thing. Okay, here you go. Here's a treat. They start to approach it. Here's another treat. And that you just kind of slowly build. So that's, that's the concept of shaping. Um, and then consistency, um, you know, the tone of your voice when you ask for a command um, and when you reward. Um, you know, when I say my puppy's name, Isa, she will, it's like a recall to her. If I say Isa, she knows she did something wrong, but you know, I'm using the same word, but it's different tone, but I'm consistent in how I do that. Um, so pay attention. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, it doesn't, we don't think about how we're saying something, um, you know, so, um, and then also with consistency, a lot of times, and I've found this personally, I get caught really flat footed with treats. Like I, I have an opportunity that I need to reinforce something and I don't have it. So what I've started doing is I have little containers of treats like everywhere around my house, like in every, you know, by every door, 
in every place where we spend a lot of time so that they're right there within reaching distance. And if there's something that I need to reinforce, if there's something that I need to talk to her about in dog language, um, I can, right? Like I can, I can get that to her. Um, so I also have a tug toy, you know, by the back door because I know if she's out there and she's barking at the neighbor dog, <laughs> What she will respond to is me saying she will she will hear me. She Isa, and as soon as she turns her head, I wave that tug. I start to run away from her, and I can get her to leave that dog alone and stop barking at him. And then I reward her. So like I have the tools where I need them when I need them. Um, so it's just super. It's the I. It's taken me to the third dog to learn that <laughs> to learn that. So I'm sharing that all with you. Um, so training at home, as, as I mentioned, training happens all the time. It doesn't have to be a formal time. It doesn't have to be. And in fact, I don't, I don't like training to be a formal time because then the dogs tend to expect it. And then it becomes five o'clock and you're like, I'm so tired. I don't want to do this. Um, so I like to just kind of do a little bit throughout the day. Um, ask for, ask for something at, at you know, before they eat, um, ask for, ask for a couple things, play a little bit after you're done with work, um, you know, do a little bit of work, you know, throughout the day. Um, the, the old adage, a tired dog is a good dog, you know, walking is great, but that might not be the most tiring for your dog that actually might amp them up. It actually might, you know, make them a little bit more stimulated. So think about mental work, training tires them out. Um, you know, there, I have a slide later on, on, you know, other toys and other things that kind of like work their brain and use those instinctual, um, instinctual needs. So, and also just, you know, make it fun, catch them doing good. Um, it's like, I've, I've heard teachers say this about kid, about, you know, children, um, catch them doing good. You, if you're working on, you know, a go to place command and that dog is just laying on that bed anyway, give them treats because that's the place that you want to encourage them to go to. Um, if they're looking quietly out the door, give them some treats, tell them they did a good job. Say, you know, like catch them doing what you're doing instead of always correcting catch and reinforce the good stuff. Um, and so, and then clicker or no, I, it's a great tool. I'm just not organized, even though I say I have toys, I have treats and toys everywhere. I'm not organized to have a clicker on me at all times. So I use my voice, right? Like again, going back to like your, your voice is your, your voice is your clicker. And if you have your, if you, if you've, uh, cemented that tone and, and, you know, you should be able to just, but you've got to be on it, right? You've got to, Hey, this is, you know, this is when I'm telling you what to do. Um, so, uh, so engaging with games. So here's a few things that, you know, for, for the high energy dogs, for the puppies, for the, the ones that are thinkers, um, a couple of them that have worked for me that we have a lot of fun with around here, literally hide and seek. If you have a partner, have the partner hold the dog back you literally go hide somewhere in your house and call your dog and let them find you. It's easy as that. Um, it does help with recall because, and you know, as soon as they find you, lots of praise, lots of, you know, play with them, have fun, good, have a good time with them. Um, because then if you need to call their name sometime, you know, when they're out in the yard, like this just helps to reinforce that. Um, the shell game, like, you know, you've got three cups and you've got a treat underneath of it show the dog the treat, move everything around, let them find it. Use the, you know, use their nose, let them, let them work at it. Um, I've, I've read somewhere that like that sniffing and, and having that and being able to do that actually uses their brain and, and can tire them out quite a bit more than, you know, physical exercise. Um, hot and cold. We actually did this. We used to do this with our older dog. We haven't, we don't do it with the younger one, but we probably should literally the, like, like with people, hot and cold. Again, this is a tone of voice game. So, you know, you hide something or, you know, you throw a treat and they kind of saw where it went, but, you know, you just like, it's in the tone of voice, like hot, 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 hot. You're getting more excited as they get to get to the close to the thing. And then, oh, cold, <laughs> um, wait for it. So impulse control, right? This one's a hard one. This one's a hard one, especially for puppies. Um, you know, you just, you, put something down. If they, you tell them to wait, if they don't wait, it goes away. Um, it's just as easy as having like a treat in your hand. And if they just look at it, 
great. And then you give it to them. Um, or you say, okay, and you release it to them. And, you know, it's, it's impulse control is a hard thing. Like my dogs all sit and wait for dinner. <laughs> they don't just get it. They have to sit, they have to wait, they get a release because we're always working on stuff like that. Um, retrieving, you know, it's not just fetch, you know, you can retrieve in the house, small little bursts of retrieve, um, orientation games. Like I said, the, the, um, the, the trainers, absolute dogs, they, this is, they're big on orientation games. So you, you know, you throw, throw a treat away. The dog runs and gets the treat as soon as they look back at you. Yes, good girl. And then you, you know, you throw another and, and you just keep that game and you are the source of what is fun. And as soon as they look at you, that is the reward. And then of course my dog's favorite, which is tug. Um, they love to tug Dobermans, their thing is possession. They love to possess what the thing is. And so, um, and, and a lot of people, you know, it's an old wives tale basically that, you know, tug makes a dog more, um, can make a dog aggressive. It's, it's how you play it, right? It's, it's, you gotta let the dog win sometimes. Um, you can't just frustrate them. Um, so, you know, tug is a great, and, and my, um, you know, Gilly, my agility dog, I used that as her reward after an agility run. She would just go run and get her, she'd get her leash and we would just tug, 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 tug all the way out the ring and then keep tugging because she kept wanting to tug. And I mean, so that was her, that was her reward for a job well done. So, um, so downtime. Sometimes we don't always want to spend all the time with our dogs. So licking and chewing, and I would should have put in here sniffing, um, our instinctual needs, they actually release endorphins in your dog. Um, it's just, it's what they need to do. So um, stuffed Kong toys, you know, I think everybody knows those by now, but um, freeze them for an extra challenge. You can put a ton of stuff in them. We have blueberry bushes at my house. And so we have frozen blueberries in like a, a freezer in, in our, an extra freezer in our basement. So it's peanut butter and some frozen blueberries that go in that Kong. Um, you know, they go in the freezer. You can do yogurt. You can do um, some, some wet food if you like. Um, you know, pretty much anything that the dog likes, you can stick in there. Um, licky mats and snuffle mats. Um, licky mats do, I mean, that literally, it's just a rubber mat, if you haven't seen it, um, that you smear basically what you would put in, in a stuffed Kong, you put on the mat, um, and, and licking is a soothing thing for them. So if you have a dog that licks other things that you don't want them to lick, this might be a good option, um, because this is something that they are, that is good for them to engage with. Um, although I would say I wouldn't leave it with them. They can, they're, pretty chewable sometimes. Um, and then snuffle mats, they're just basically like, a, they're like a fleece. Um, they can be fleece, they can be, you know, other, other material, but it's, you stick kibble, you stick a small treat down in it and the dog has to sniff to find each piece that's in there and it can keep them busy for quite a while. Um, there are puzzle toys. One of my favorite, um, the person who makes them is Nina Otteson. If you look for her name, anywhere. Chewy sells them. Amazon sells them. Um, the dog has to interact with it. They have to unlock things. They have to move things around. They have to, they sniff it, they find it. Um, and, and, you know, the reward is working, but you don't have to be, you know, you, it's not coming from you. It's they're doing it themselves. Um, frozen marrow bones. That's one of, I, I love that. We call it the babysitter in my house. Um, we just get them from the grocery store. Those like the marrow soup bones, stick them in the freezer. They take hours. <laughs> Uh, and they're really great. They're great for chewing. They're great for teeth. Um, and it definitely keeps them busy. Um, other chews, bully sticks, antlers, Himalayan yak chews, um, not rawhide, but beef cheek. It's similar, but beef cheek, they, they come in rolls. They're like these big, thick rolls. Um, but those are just some other things that you can, you know, kind of work to keep your dog occupied. Um, when you can't engage with them necessarily. Um, and then separation. So I know we talked a little bit about with creating. Um, yes, someday this quarantine will end and we are all concerned about what's going to happen with our dogs. Um, I have friends, you know, there are, I have friends who are in, you know, rescue and in, and in, and they are mortified and very, very concerned when all these quarantine puppies are left alone to their own devices, what's going to happen to them. Um, because there won't be people here all day and, and they're so used to it. So it's never too soon to start, you know, doing that sort of training. Um, like I said, figure out, you know, figure out what works for you. Dogs need, they need structure and we give them too much credit and too much freedom too soon. Um, 
you know, and like I, I'm, I'm, I probably did it myself with the puppy, you know, out in the yard barking, but you know, it's cold out right now. And I don't wanna be outside with a long line. So when spring comes, we're gonna reinforce some things with a long line out in the yard. Um, but uh, anyway, getting back to and getting back to the crate. So, you know, figure out works for what works for you. If it's a crate, if it's an X pen, if they have their own room, um, you know, if the whole house is fine, but I would not do that until you absolutely trust, absolutely trust your dog. Um, the smaller the space to begin with, they have to, like a little kid, right? You have to, you know, prove <laughs> that you can do it, um, that you can handle it. Um, a lot of times, a lot of separation comes from the dog just being overwhelmed and thinking that they have to take care of this whole space. If you make the space a little smaller, they don't have to worry about that big space. They don't have to worry about, I have to be here and then I have to be here and then they get amped up and then they get concerned and then they get worried and then they start to chew a thing because they, you know, rather than facing what they're worried about. Um, so if you kind of make the space a little smaller and more cozy for them. So again, you know, once you figure out how you want to do it, start with small increments with the crate um, or your, or an X pen or however you want to do. Uh, I did have, I literally had, um, our, our second dog had, she had a room that she would go in when we were away at work. You know, our, our older dog had the rest of the house and Gilly had her room. It had a, an old couch in it. It had, a, you know, and she was fine. That was, that was what worked for her. Um, a really great crate training resource um, is Susan Garrett's Crate Games. And you can, I have a website right there. She, she does a really good job of explaining kind of and, and doing some good training exercises to get the dog to like to be in the crate. I mean, for a lot of dogs, it is their safe space. It is their den. Um, but, but sometimes it, they need a little encouragement for that. And so she's a great resource and that's a really wonderful, um, it, there's a video series on the website um, that, that's really good at, at teaching crates. So then finally, and we're almost done with slides so we can get to you know, the fun part. So um, some training resources, the AKC, I mean, they, they are the experts on dogs. They have great training, um, training advice on their website. Um, as I mentioned, Susan Garrett, she has a website, dogsthat.com. Um, blogs, I have a book and podcast list on another slide. Um, a lot of really great trainers out there are putting so much wonderful advice out there online. Um, and then I put a special note, avoiding quarantine puppy syndrome. There's a really good website that I um, had referred to a couple of times myself um, on there. So let's see. And then um, some other resources, some books, if you want to you know, read an old fashioned book, these are really great, really knowledgeable resources um, on, you know, the mind of the dog and, and kind of in psychology and, um, and kind of getting behind the way they think. Um, and then a, an amazing podcast for any podcast listeners, Cog Dog Radio, Sarah. Um, Sarah is, I, I would love someday to meet her. It would be like, you know, I'd be fangirling over her all the time, but um, she has such a positive way and such a, and she, she's also another trainer that really understands the needs of a dog and how, and, and finding ways to address that. And she has some wonderful resources, um, you know, throughout her podcast. So, and then just finally, you know, extra credit, if you're really enjoying it, there's some other stuff you can do. Um, literally canine good citizen certifications where I started. That's what I, you know, that's, that's what I thought was the ultimate. Um, and I had no idea where else I could go from there, but we've gone many, many places. Um, so there's, uh, there's therapy dog certification, our older dog, actually, um, both of our older dogs were certified as therapy dogs before all of this started. Um, and, and, uh, Tess, my older, my old, old girl, um, she would go with me over to a college campus and like, she'd get loved on by the college students who totally needed it. Um, and they, she had a fan club. You know, so, and it's, it's so, it's so nice. And it's, it's a, a certification for that is, um, you know, how do they do in, in different environments? How do they do with, you know, wheelchairs or, you know, how, how are, it's, it's a kind of a temperament evaluation, but, um, but training as well. Um, trick dog titles, it's just for fun. Uh, if you want to look into those a little bit um, and then performance events, there are more dog sports 
cropping up than, <laughs> um, I, I can't keep track of them. Most of these I've done myself. Um, well, maybe not all of them, but several of these I've done myself and they're super fun. Um, you know, a lot of those, so to be considered a performance event, it's more instinctual. So lore coursing, they literally chase a plastic bag and, and my dogs go, I mean, screaming crazy when they see and they know that that's what's happening. Um, barn hunt, there are, there are rats in tubes. They're totally safe. Um, buried in bales of hay and the dogs have to find them and tell you where they are. Um, it's really great for dogs that love to, to sniff and to find things and to hunt. Um, dock diving, literally jumping off a dock and, and going for a thing. That is a sport now. Um, frisbee dog, herding trials, hunting trials, and then companion sports like agility, obedience, um, rally and tracking. And there's more, there's more information on that from the AKC. Um, it's, it, it can consume you. Uh, it has definitely consumed my life, um, but it's but it's a really rewarding way. I mean, you know, like I said, dogs were bred to be with us and to work with us, and so um, you know, I've really found I found so much beyond the ribbons, beyond the awards, beyond the accolades. That connection to have with a dog is something that you you can't beat it. So. Um, so yeah, now um, I want to thank you, you know, again for your time and attention. This is a picture of, this is my puppy. <laughs> um, my agility trainer is actually, a, is also a professional photographer, so she took this picture. Um, but yeah, uh, let's, you know, if you want to open it up to some more questions. Um, I think I addressed some of the things, but we might not have gotten into, into specifics. So, um, you know, if there's other questions. And then, you know, if you want to, if you want to talk, you can, you know, find me on, I'm on Facebook, like, you know. Many people still are. Uh, and then if you want to email me, my email is right there. So thank you. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> thank you so much, Nicole. I've, I, I checked the box that says allows uh, participants oh. to unmute themselves. So you should be able to right. unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question or um, just throw something out to the group. So yeah, Judy, go ahead. I have one that occurred to me while you were talking. Um, of course, Fonzie's just uh, six months old, but, and it's real snowy here, so there hasn't been a lot of chance for digging in the last couple months, but he uh -huh. was just loving up my garden. Yeah. So I'd like some tips on how to nip that in the bud. Well, what did you say? Oh, he's a Havanese. So that's interesting. Yes. They're not, they're not really known as diggers. Um, I would... I would catch him at it and, and, re, and redirect him to do something else. You know, or give him something else that's more fun when you're outside. Or sometimes what people will do is, is they will create a space in the yard that the dog can just dig in. Like that is their space. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> if, if, if all else fails. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, like, I, like I had mentioned at the top, kind of like, sometimes you just have to get creative and sometimes you have to give into what those natural impulses are going to be. And as long okay. as they're not really, you know, if they're not, you know, if they're not destroying your prize roses, if there's a space where they can do it, and if that's a need that they have, sometimes you just have to give into it. But I would, okay. I would try redirecting first, um, okay. same as any other problem behavior, right? So, um, you know, the, the famous thing with like, puppies biting your hands, redirect to yeah. it, redirect <laughs> to something else. Um, and when do they stop biting? Supervision. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's hard. You just want to be like, no, just go out in the yard and be by yourself. But I mean, I, like with my puppy, with her just kind of like loving to bark at the neighborhood, I know she's outside. And as soon as I hear it, I am out a door and I'm like, hey, <laughs> let's have a conversation about this. <laughs> Come to this, you know, Let's let's engage yeah. in something else because she's okay. you know to look at. I started like, doing that too. I do not want to bark the dog. Mm -mm. I forgot to say I'm probably the oldest one here. I'm the class of '68. Oh, welcome. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I love Worcester, so yes. this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, Ron had a question about neutering. It's it's interesting. And yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. So, so spaying and neutering, um, he says he's done a bunch of reading and it seems that conventional wisdom has been evolving. Yes, it, it has. Um, they're starting to find that if you can handle it, if you can, if you can deal with it for a while is to, and especially 
it's harder with males to know when they're fully mature, but a large breed tends to mature at like 18 months to two years of age. If you can handle it that long, and if you can, you know, make sure that your dog doesn't have any accidents, um, the hormones that come along with fully maturing, um, they're starting to find that with losing those too soon, they'll have, um, the, the, there's a proponent or there's a, a larger instance of ACL tears, um, things like that, because the growth plates, the hormones tend to, to make sure that the growth plates are fully closed. Um, so there's some health issues with that. There's trade-offs on health issues with different cancers though. Um, so it's, it's really up to you what you can handle for your own situation. Um, you know, what you can do. I, with confirmation dog showing, the dogs have to be intact. So I have to be hyper aware, you know, when, you know, where is my intact female when she's in season? And, you know, and, and if you are responsible and if you keep an eye on dogs, um, you know, that that's fine. A lot of people just don't want to have to deal with it either. You know, they don't want to have to deal with, you know, having to have your female in pants for a month or, you know, anything like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's really what you're, what you're comfortable with. Um, the research has definitely been evolving and it's been interesting to kind of follow those conversations. Um, I know personally, my older dog, um, was spayed before her first heat and she had spay incontinence starting at age like two, because not to get too graphic, but things will kind of like form differently when, when they're, when they're hmm. forming or, and, um, yeah, so she she had some some um, yeah yeah just just functional <laughs> issues that, that plagued her hmm. literally throughout her life. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a it's a tricky it's a tricky thing. Um, and then also Ron had a question too. Uh, best technique for inhibiting unwanted barking. Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> you just heard some unwanted barking. <laughs> Hey, Nicole, go back for a second, though. Um, when I said the literature is evolving, I've read a ton um, about spay and neutering, mostly about neutering, because our dog's a, a male. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, we got them, you know, from a, a designer breeder. Um, this is, it's, it's, it's about two thirds, this guy's about two thirds poodle. Mm -hmm. And um, after going to Worcester, I went to law school. So I, I'm speaking as a lawyer. I probably shouldn't admit this in public, and maybe I should stop right now. The contract with the breeder calls for neutering within the first six months. Um, oh. I'm a little cynical. I think some of that may be to prevent competition, okay? Well, it's it's that, but also, I mean, you know, a, a, my, so it's funny because my puppy's contract is the opposite. Right. Like she has to stay intact until she's at least 18 months old because of, because of the, you know, because of, you know, the, the growth plate issues and things. So a competition maybe, but also. I'm being mostly facetious. <laughs> I love, I love our breeder. <laughs> um, but really, I think it's, it's just to, you know, I, not everybody can handle it to be honest. Right. And so. I well, think that they're erring on the side of, of being safe and helping, you know, control overpopulation and, and, you know, breeders get a bad rap for contributing to overpopulation. And so, um, you know, if they're doing it right, they're talking to you about it at least and, and, um, contracts can, can be slightly altered too, depending on who you are and what, you know, well, that, that, was, that was the other remark I was going to make, not that this needs to go on much longer, but it seems to me in, in, in the literature I've read, when you really sort through it all, the mythology or, or, or the conventional wisdom, if you will, revolves around overpopulation. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about dogs that are well-controlled, mm -hmm. primarily on leash, for instance, um, and well-controlled that aren't just out roaming the streets looking for you know their next uh, activity, <laughs> then you're not gonna find overpopulation to be a big reason. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I can, I can go on for days about that. <laughs> I have thoughts. Um, yeah. I'll email you if we want to talk. Some sure. More. <laughs> we, can, we can chat. Definitely. 
Um, but yeah, and and but going back to your other question about about barking, uh, I think a lot of it is some of that is just how they how they communicate, right? I mean, like that's that's how a dog is going to communicate. They're going to alert you. So, you know, when when my when my puppy is barking at the door, if she sees something, I mean, I let it go a little, but then you you want to you want to train a quiet or you want to train an enough so that they know that. So going back to catching them at doing something good, if literally they're just looking out the door and they're quiet, good, you know, good quiet. So you're, you're associating with, oh yeah, I'm not barking. So and hmm. that, you have to get that, that has to be strong because the, the, the urge to bark is very strong in many dogs. Uh, and so, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to get that, you know, cement that cement that in and then start to when they bark as soon as they stop good quiet as soon as they are quiet for like a little bit so this is a little bit of shaping that I mentioned right so um as soon as they're quiet for a little bit good quiet good quiet and so eventually you can like okay I bark a little bit and then I'm quiet when I hear quiet you know so that's a that's a that's a I'm still working on it myself though <laughs> <laughs> With, with that, there comes an environment factor too, because mine, she'll be fine if I'm outside in the front with her mm -hmm. and she sees someone, but the minute we're in our house, she's mm -hmm. like territorial, like I'm protecting everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like out for death. Your, your dog is clear across mm -hmm. the street someplace, but she knows it yep. and she just, she just won't stop. Yeah. So yeah. Mm. And, and you know, sometimes it's just, you know, I, I don't know, but <laughs> again to the point of like if you can train it great if you can't you know you may have to I don't know put up different uh different curtains or I don't know you know I mean she, so, she even hears them like she'll hear them uh, like, in a yeah. totally different room no windows or anything Ugh. she just knows yeah and yeah so I would I would work on the quiet and I would work on that um start to start to kind of shape that a little bit Nicole, I think I hear you saying something that we, we read, which is you treat quiet as command. Yeah. Like stay. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. the doctor realized that word means something. Yep. Uh, and, and that it's a good thing and you get a reward for it. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of finding mm -hmm. them at the window, which our little guy is right now. Uh -huh. just laying, mm -hmm. Looking out. <laughs> I'm tempted to just leave the tree, get up and give him a treat. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and start to associate what he's doing, you know, with that, with that command. Because if if he's already doing it, great, you know, work with what work with what's happening already. Work with what you've got. So there were some questions about jumping. <laughs> I personally don't mind it if my dog jumps on me. Um, I actually, it's funny, my, again, with the agility dog, I mean, I, I want them to celebrate to me. I want them to, um, to come to me and be happy, but nobody else, right? Like that, because not everybody likes it. Not everybody wants it. Not everybody welcomes it. Um, again, I would, you know, work on with other people around or, you know, just again, put a command to it. Like, I wouldn't say down because down it's its own thing, but you know, settle or something, find something that works for you. Um, and, and start to work on that, work on it that way. Um, one thing that I do, which might be a little bit controversial, if a dog jumps at me, I get in their space. I move into them because it's uncomfortable for them to want to do it then. Like I just kind of like, I, it's almost like a body block. Um, or, or just turn and don't give them the attention at all. Like, and, and if they're not getting rewarded for it, that might extinguish itself. Um, hmm. You just kind of like, nope, nope, that's not going to happen. Right. You just turn a shoulder. You don't, you don't, you know, don't pat the dog at all. You, you don't put your hands on them. You just kind of like, you use it with your body, you use your body to kind of get out of the way. Um, now that's hard to teach a stranger to do that, but you know, if they start to learn that they can't get that from you, they might stop not doing it with other people. Um, that would be my follow-up question, because I think she gets it with me. 
you yeah. know, I do kind of a sit and she'll wait and she'll know she gets a treat if she doesn't jump on me when I walk in the door. Yeah. But, you know, we have a, like a couple neighbors who she sees often and yeah. maybe one time out of five, she'll sit, but the rest mm -hmm. of the time it's just, but they're, you know, talking to, they're giving her more attention, which I've read any attention is, you know, good. It's a, it, it's enforcement of some kind, positive reinforcement. Yes. Right. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm trying to say, oh, you know, don't talk to her for a second, just wait, she'll settle. But yeah, I was going to ask, do you treat. know them well enough to have that conversation with them? <laughs> Luckily, you know, I only see limited number of people these days, so I probably could work that in. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would, right. And say like, hey, listen, this is just something that we're working on. So like, you know, um, here's how we're, here's how we're trying to, to work it through. Um, because yeah, I mean, you, you, you don't know who's kind of, you know, you don't want that happening to some random person out and about who has a terrible fear of dogs or you know whatever so um, I think yeah 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 I would talk to I would actually talk to them about it and and you know like <laughs> get them on your side <laughs> yeah no oh, Kathy has to run mm -hmm. Kathy I hope I answered your question if I didn't please email me what about um like puppy training classes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I haven't considered it because of COVID, but yep. I get my second COVID shot next this week. So I'll be able to go out and do things. Yeah. We I mean, don't have a lot of buddies around the neighborhood he plays yeah. with. So he's well socialized. Yeah. So yes, puppy training classes. They, I, I, I would not, my, I personally would not have a puppy that didn't go through one. Um, it's just good for them to know that. And if you can do it as a, as a group class, right? Um, yeah. Because it's good for them to have the awareness that not every dog is there to play with you because you don't know, right? Like you're taking a hike, your dog is on leash. The dog that's, you know, coming at you that isn't on leash might not be friendly, right? And so you don't want to necessarily have a dog that just thinks everybody's a friend. So puppy classes, in addition to, you know, just a good foundation for any training that you're doing is also a really good opportunity to have the dog learn that sometimes other dogs can be around and I don't have to engage with them. And mm -hmm. I want to have with my person instead. Um, so yeah, no, I would, I would, I would definitely, and, and going back to the slide about, you know, I don't, I don't know where you live, but, um, you know, look for, look for, uh, an all breed kennel club. Um, okay. have really I live place. near Columbus, Ohio. Oh my gosh. You have a ton of resources out that way. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 Okay. I might be able to find, uh, yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely breed clubs and kennel clubs out there that would be, that should have classes at this point. Okay, great. One, one thing to yeah. share with the group, yeah, it's on. Um, we found in, in two different locations, our neighborhood here uh, in particular, um, there are individuals mm -hmm. who do what we call doggy daycare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's a woman who, uh, that's what she does. Yeah. And she has a fully fenced in backyard and our dog goes there two days a week mm -hmm. and plays with other dogs. The, the, the two days in question are her small dog days. And the point of this was just to say that we, you couldn't find this woman with any resource that Google has out there. Yeah. She's not fine. Mm -hmm. yep. But by word of mouth, <laughs> bumping into somebody on the street who also had a Labradoodle, one thing led to another. You know, and, and her name's Cindy. We found Cindy. Mm -hmm. um, and we were recently, we took a, several weeks um, because we could and, and put, put our lovely dog in, in, a, in a crate in the back of the car and drove all the way to Amelia Island. Mm -hmm. And on day three, we, we were at doggy daycare there. Same thing. Just bumped mm -hmm. into people, asked some questions. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you can only find those resources by word of mouth. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and and I'll, I'll you know my my agility trainer, she's not anywhere. She does you know her her classes. She does them out of her house. She has a, a building now in the house in the the new house that she's in. She has a small, you know, a small outbuilding, so we can do indoor classes. But I found her by word of mouth. Her name is Cindy too, actually. Um, but 
uh, yeah, it's the dog world is interesting, right? Because the big names, right? Like your Petco, your PetSmart, your Caesar Milan, like those names are out there, but they're not necessarily going to be the best for every dog. Um, so yeah, a little bit of hunting, a little bit of word of mouth. Um, and I think the more you are, are, ex you are exposed to, um, different trainers, different, you know, people who have other dogs, like, you, you know, you start to get that, um, you start to get those names, but, uh, I, I'll find some Columbus things for you. Thank you. Actually, I live in Newark, which is just 30 miles okay. east. Columbus. I know exactly where that is. <laughs> yep. Somehow I ended up back in Ohio after 47 years in Michigan. Uh -huh. So I'm glad to be here. Yeah. There's a really famous agility facility not far from Newark called Incredipause. It's right along I-70. Ah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think they just do agility classes, but, um, but they're, uh -huh. they're fantastic. So. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I've been all over. Let me tell you, I've been all over with these dogs. <laughs> <laughs> all over. I think Kathy, oh, Kathy had to run, but she had, she had more jumping questions. Did, did we get to, did I, did I give you stuff for that? Did, is everybody good with yeah, that was helpful. jumping questions? I had one more about barking, although I think you've, mm. Kind of based on what you were saying, I think I'm kind of getting it too. We have, um, so I'm in an apartment building and they have a neighbor with an older dog and they often go out more in the middle of the night than I would like to be going out, but she can hear them. They're upstairs neighbor and smell them going past our door and um, has been waking up. And it's new because she'd been sleeping through the night probably from, I want to say almost like four months, really early. And she's been really good, but I don't know if it's because it's winter and it's quieter or something, but um, I'm really kind of feel like we've had a little sleep progression if that's a thing for dogs <laughs> like um, yeah and I'm trying to think about like I was trying to experiment with where she's sleeping you know and what room she's in mm -hmm. um, so maybe she can't hear them or smell them or whatever it is but I'm not sure because she barks then yeah and it's like I don't really want her barking at three o'clock in the morning right yeah oof yeah that's it yeah. that's, that's a tricky one um, but I think it might be like, I mean, like you said, with the curtains, I mean, I'm closing things, but even yeah. um, for training, actually, I was going to say too, we, I found a dog training club in my area and I've been so happy with them. I had never heard of them before. It was just mm -hmm. word of mouth, like you said. Yeah. Um, and I noticed that when we're in the classes, they do a lot with expandable gates just to break the dog's field of vision. Yes. So I've been putting those like I have, you know, just plastic gates and putting one by the outside door thinking maybe if there's even more visually there, she'll feel yeah. a little more protected. I don't know, but yeah, I mean, it just could be, it's a weird thing. Right. And she just needs to, it might just be that she's trying to tell you, Hey, there's a weird thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. Have you, have you tried like, no, 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 it's okay. It's fine. Yeah. And usually then I'll call her, you know, into my room with me and yeah, but it, it yeah. That's true. Just kind of reassuring. She may just need to like acclimate to it because it's different. Yeah. It's yeah. weird. I mean, <laughs> the other day the puppy was out in the yard and like our neighbor kids have had left a sled. And she was barking because there was a sled. Mom, there is a sled. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I see it. Thank you. <laughs> Please stop telling me that there's a sled. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes it's sometimes it, you have to kind of like, you know, experiment with what works, but um, yeah, I might just try like, yeah, 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 no, no, I hear it. It's fine. And just kind of like leave it. And if like, if you don't react to it, I don't know. Thanks. That was a long, complicated, a lot of backstory for a small problem, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, you know, I, I, this was absolutely fantastic and interesting, Nicole, and thank you so much for giving of your time and preparing this. And you know, Nicole has left her email there. Um, we'll also follow up and send out the PowerPoint so you have the the links and all of that good stuff uh, to follow up with. But um, we want to say, you know, thank you to Nicole and thank you to all of you for joining us to this afternoon and for talking about, you know, the members of our family, the dogs that we have, and uh, uh, we hope that you enjoy the rest of your Sunday and look for more interesting content as part of the Alumni Winter College and then uh, more, more programs to come.